All right, so important before we get started, um, I think somebody's dropped, dropped the links in the chat, but if you would sign in for us. And around 200 folks, so we want to be sure to capture who's here and who's not. So take that signing before we get started. All right, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. I figure we're going to use up all of our time, if not some more. Well, that's pretty much the same thing, except for that sign in. Ignore that. Have to delete the old slide. All right, so in addition to the folks here on the screen, We've also got um, several other people from our team, but Sue Ann Stalmaker will be presenting towards the end of the session. That's where you're going to get your uh, CEU credits. So didn't leave her off. Her name's just later on in the slide deck. Next slide. Okay, so our agenda is looking a little different. Um, moving forward, we're going to try to change it up. Since we're having to meet this way, not face to face, we want to make it as a uh, we want to be able to collaborate as much as we can. We'd like to talk to some new folks, different folks, um, and then also those CEU credits. We thought by adding that it would hopefully entice more people to attend these events. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open up with a, um, a welcome from Home Base Advisory member, and then we're going to try to keep our product updates up to 30, 45 minutes at most, hopefully. Um, got some group spotlights, and then the training's going to last an hour. Um, and then we'll wrap up with any questions and allow you to speak, ask questions, or collaborate however you want to. All right, next slide. All right, so I think I've made Emily presenter, but today we've got Emily Jones with us. She's a member of the Home Base Advisory uh, Group. Um, she's from New Hanover County. And recently, she was the 20 Power School Innovator of the Year. So I've asked her to speak a little bit about Home Base Advisory. Um, and this is the purpose of, of including these folks in these presentations or meetups um, is to kind of allow or you know, allow the opportunity to to speak to these guys, um, know that they're there for a purpose, and Emily's going to share that purpose with you. But we thought it'd be good to start bringing these folks on board and allowing them to speak. So Emily, are you there? Can you hear me, Justin? I can. Okay. Thanks for agreeing. Good morning, everyone. And first of all, I'd like to say welcome to a new school year. I know that we're doing things um, totally different this year. We're in unprecedented times, but um, I believe wholeheartedly in the success at CCI as well as my fellow coordinators that we will get the job done as we have always done. Um, as Justin told you, I am part of the Home Base Advisory Committee. I am just one member of that advisory committee. And the purpose of this committee is there are a group of um, coordinators and stakeholders that are here to actually advocate for you as the um, users out in the field. So we come together and we talk about our topics dealing with power school or home base. It's not exactly um, limited just to power school, but we are your power school representatives. Um, and what I will say about that is anytime that you have something that is going on, everyone has my email address, everyone has the groups I may not um, talk on groups as much as I used to, but I do monitor all of the information that's going out and all of the issues. And we are trying to be your first line of defense for Justin and Rob to help them to on top of anything that may be happening out in the field. So, I see the question. And, then this is Emily Jones with New Hanover County Schools, and I will put my actual email address in the chat for everyone. That way, everyone will have it.
So if there are any questions or things that you would like for us to share or bring up during the week, like I said, feel free to contact me and I will be more than welcome and happy to work with Justin and the whole entire team. I think we have a really good team now at DPI and I'm very, very excited about the new things that we are doing. Justin. Thank you, Emily. I see somebody that asked how to join the Google group. I don't know if you can drop some. They can email me. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Next slide. All right. So the product updates, um, we're going to cover these items listed here, PMR, SAR, common follow-up, um, legislative class size, student learning preferences, GPA lockdown. Um, we're going to talk about some data entry errors that we've seen since the start of school. Um, power school upgrade, we'll talk about that a little. And then last, uh, student contacts that I know everybody's waiting to move to. Okay, next slide. Okay. <clears throat> PMR was supposed to be fixed over maintenance weekend. And when we ended up Coming back on Monday, we we noticed there's now two new problems. So you're able to run the PMR. Well, several of you have put cases in saying you can't, but for those who can, we're seeing that there's a problem with PMR 13 for those XG students who um, that's causing a what we're going to have to do now because we can't afford to wait another month and every. Every item that touches state reporting, we can't just a, a fix throughout the week or on a weekend like we can with several other things. But with state reporting, we have to wait on a monthly package to be pushed out, and that happens during the maintenance weekend. So because we can't wait till October or November for this fix, there's a temporary workaround. If you're getting a PMR 13 fatal error, and it's because you're uh, it's because students can't graduate in a grade level like I think it's less than 11. So what it's doing is it's saying, hey, you've got some students who are showing a graduation or showing graduates, but with a grade level of negative nine. So it's throwing that fatal error. So what you're going to have to do for now is just move those students to the 12th grade, run your PMR, submit it, and then you can move them back to uh, XG negative nine. And then we've talked about this. I'm going to go ahead and put it out there just so you 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 hear it now, but. When you go to run month two, there's a good chance that if we haven't fixed it in production by then, you'll have to do the very same thing again. So when you are ready to run and approve your PMR, go ahead and move those students to grade 12 and then right back to negative nine. Submitted. All right, the other item, I wish I had an answer. We pushed Power School to try to help us get in. All we can say now is they're working on this problem found that students in daily attendance schools are receiving 100% ADA, ADM, so it's not recognizing any of the absences that have been entered. Um, I don't know if that's happening for everybody, but we're seeing it pretty widespread. Uh, yesterday, Rob, and you're breaking in. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're breaking in and out. I don't know if everyone else is, is seeing you break in and out, but you're breaking in and out a little bit. Okay. And, all right, so are there any updates there, Rob? Or are we still checking into the attendance that up these? We, we are still checking into the attendance. We, just to let you all know, we are requiring them to talk with us daily, uh, excuse me, multiple times a day about this issue. We understand the importance of PMRs, especially PMR1 and PMR2. So we're working with them to get a fix as fast as they can. We know that they are working in an environment right now trying to see if they can isolate what is causing this and then get it fixed. And it is my hope that we can provide you with something. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm an optimist. I'm going to tell you hopefully by the end of the day today, if not tomorrow, uh, but we will be giving you frequent updates to let you know where we are with this issue because we understand its importance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, next slide. Um, but I will say that everybody's aware of this. So everybody at DPI that needs to know, you know, 
they're aware that this is a problem. So don't think that you're going to miss any deadlines because we know what's going on. And we're going to work with Power School and continue to work with you to make sure everything's correct and you, you get your PMR submitted. All right. SAR. So I wasn't on the webinar, but I was um, monitoring the chat that came through. John, thank you for helping LaShawn with that webinar, but I realized there were some questions that maybe didn't get answered or we may have dropped off before you got the answers. So LaShawn asked me to share these with you guys. Um, I was told earlier that if we could just get the SAR going, I might get a trophy or something, but I'm not, not able to do that yet. Um, so SAR is still going to be due, and this should take you through pretty much what you're going to be expected to do. You, you don't have to do everything that we used to do for, for the SAR, um, but we still have to submit some of the information. So do we have to fill in the fields for the sections, how taken course length, all that good stuff? The course attributes are not required for the SAR personnel summary report. So that's some of the items you don't have to worry about, and I know that's usually what took me the longest, was making sure all those attributes were set correctly. So good news is you don't have to do that this year. Do we fill in the staff roles and duty for SAR? That is required. So yes, you still have to put the roles and duties in. John, that that next one there, I don't know. Can you speak more to that? Because I wasn't on when that was discussed. Yes, yeah, so the next one was asking if a student student's homeroom changes, do they have to do anything with the SAR essentially? Um, which of course the answer there was no, you just adjust the class enrollment if it's just a homeroom change. Um, for a grade level change is where you would use that R1, W1 uh, reentry codes. Okay, thank you. Um, the next I did here during the webinar, um, and I think this is one we go back to every year. Do we assign W1 or a W2 for the no-show students? Sean came back and said, you will assign a W1 code. Next slide. Um, yeah, this is one I emailed LaShawn about. I think this pretty much says the same thing, but it's just adding, um, you know, if they're under 16, they have to stay on the roster. So that, I think I could have combined those last two questions and just gave you this part. Do you see anything different in there, John? Uh, nope, I think that pretty well covers it. Um, 16 and over, you do the no-show. Under 16, keep marking absent. Yep. And then the last one there, I have checked with everybody I could think to check with. But it was asked if Social Security number for staff members are required for the SAR. They're not required for the SAR, and I've, after everybody I've talked to, I don't see anything that says it has to be in power school at all. There's nothing pulling social security number. As far as I'm concerned, social security number is not required in power school. Next slide. All right, this is one. This report used to not get much attention. And that reason they have just gotten in the habit of approving it and moving on with life. But it's pretty important now to commerce that the CFU gets submitted accurately. Uh, so if you've already approved it, um, I know we're going to ask you to unapprove it and run it again. But you may not have noticed that the half credits from the COVID grading that we stored this spring are not showing. Now, when I say that, not both half credits are not showing, but one of the two are not showing. So the way we had to go about making sure that you could store two half credits for the exact same course in the same section, um, the changes we had to make there are preventing one of those half credits from displaying on the CFU report. So we know that we're trying to work with PowerSchool and we're working internally to see what needs to be done to correct that. But um, we realize that's going on. If you approve it, please unapprove it um, and just make sure you at least ran the report because we need everybody to run it. Um, if we have to do an internal workaround, then that's going to require you to actually hit the run button. So we need that done. But we don't want you to approve it until further notice. Rob, do you have anything to add? I know you met this morning with some folks on that. 
Yeah, I did not have an opportunity, but he's exactly right. What we are asking is that you do not approve it, but that it must be run. So you've got to run the CFU, and we are keeping track of kind of who's running it and who's not running it. So I'd appreciate if everyone on this call would run their uh, CFU report. Um, Justin, we also, I just got a, a question here that I think is worth um, mentioning. The problem with the, C, with the, going back to the PMR, the problem with the PMR is daily attendance schools, but the meeting attendance schools should be reporting fine. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and if you're still seeing red circles on your PMR, it is most likely because you have some entry dates and exit dates that are wrong. Uh, the red circle issue has been fixed unless you have data problems. Is that correct as well? That's right, and then the email went out. I think Yolanda sent it yesterday or the day before. That kind of shows if you're not able to run it what you might need to check for. Yeah. I mentioned that there's some power tool reports that can help you. Yeah, that, that's good. Thank you, sir. But yes, that's right on the CFU report. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Next slide. And if you see questions pop up that we need to address, we can stop at any minute. All right. The fall legislative class size report, I did share with you last time that it is still going to be collected. So we, we are still going to require you to submit this report for fall. The latest changes went out over the last maintenance weekend, and here you'll see the number changes, the enrollment totals, um, which I don't think it ended up changing this go around. I think they put a halt to the to the step where every year it was going to change by one. But anyway, LEA wide class size max average should be 18. Individual class size max is 21. Um, that's reflected in the new reports. Next slide. All right, these are the biggies I wanted to go over with you today. Um, the dual language immersion special program has been out there, um, but I put that here just, just in case you didn't realize it was there. But we've got some new, we've got another new special program that's been put out. Um, these two, the way we did it, um, we decided to put it in special programs because it's easier to exclude a special program than try to build something else in the logic of the report. So by doing it this way, you're in control, and we're not hoping that PowerSchool gets the code right to, to exclude what needs to be excluded from the legislative class size report. So this is done at the section level, and if you've got sections of dual language immersion courses, then you can flag it as a North Carolina dual language immersion special program at the section level. Same thing, we added an instructional pullout special program title. This one is the one you need to listen to. In the past, we tried to exclude classes based on a course code, like if it's an EC course code, um, or if it was like four or less. But, you know, what we've learned is three students in an EC pullout is small to some, whereas in Wake County, seven students is small. So we can't determine what's a real pullout and what's not based on a number. Only you know what's a true pullout. So we're giving you <laughs> we're giving you the opportunity to just go in and flag it yourself and you tell us if it's an easy pullout or instructional pullout rather, um, then you flag it. So this should help a lot because we had ones and twos and fours, you know, it was a mess previously, but hopefully this will clean it up a little bit. But this will be included in the legislative class size documentation that's going to be released. So if you don't understand what I'm talking about, don't worry right yet because we're going to update that. But the only confusing part, I think, is when you go to the section page, it doesn't say special program. It says program, and there's a drop down. And a lot of people confuse the two. They don't realize it's the same. but it actually says program, and in that drop down is a list of all the special programs. And these were pushed out from the Enterprise Controller, so everybody should have these special programs in your list. So if you've assigned it correctly to the sections that are either doing immersion or instructional pullouts, then they'll be excluded from um, not all of the reports, but the ones that impact the average. So on the class size report itself, that's basically just a data dump that shows all of, like everything, homeroom, 
any little crazy class that you've got set up, it shows every section, every course in your school. So you'll still see these there, but that, that doesn't matter. That's intentional. Okay, next slide. Timeline, this is another one I need you to pay attention to. Um, my deadline is around the 15th of December, and I always like to try to get it to the superintendent's office early. Um, so that's why I put there to please try to submit it by the 15th. Last year we were able to collect it before the deadline. I think we got it in a week and a half, two weeks early, which was good. Um, but the part that we didn't know back when we were creating the fall report <clears throat> was the, the opening, the submission start date. Um, right now it says September 17th. We can't change that. So it says the 17th, but ignore that because you won't even have the finance file loaded until around the second week of October. Um, the reason we allow you to run it earlier, so it says submission uh, start date, but we don't want you to submit it that early, but we do want you to be able to run it that early so that you can start seeing the beginning of, you know, where you might need to start cleaning up. But if you've got new teachers or staff changes, um, those will not be in there until we get that September payroll file loaded. So September payroll goes out to your, you know, your staff members get paid at the end of September. Then payroll reports that back to DPI, and it's usually seven to ten days before I can get a hold of the finance report for the whole state and provide that to Power School. I have let Power School know that there may be some tickets coming in for people that may not be on this webinar. If they start seeing errors, I imagine tickets are going to start going to Power School. But I've told them just to respond back to all the tickets saying that, you know, we need to wait on that payroll file to be loaded. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so districts will have over a month to clean up any schedule. So if you start running those reports now, then, you know, you've got now until November 30th to get everything cleaned up and in order. But we are asking that you submit any cases directly to Power School. Don't send them to service now. And then they'll report back to us if needed. All right. You can go to the next slide, please. All right, this is a new item. We've talked about it before. Um, when the COVID hit and we sent students and staff members home, we told you that we were working on some staff and student connectivity fields. Um, we had everything ready to go. Matter of fact, the teacher stuff went out already, but we pumped our brakes a little because um, our school actually came back and said, hey, Texas is working on something that you guys might like. And I'm telling you, this is way more than we were going to give you. So. There's a reason we stopped and we put the teacher connectivity and access fields out, but we paused on the student stuff because what we were going to put out was very minimal compared to this. So this page, we've got, um, John, I didn't link to the QRD there because I didn't know if you finished with it, but no, we are pretty close to wrapping up a QRD for staff and student um, connectivity learning preferences. But this is actually, in Power School, located under the Enroll tab. So if you pull up a student and you go over to the left under Enrollment, you're going to see the Learning Preferences link. That'll take you to to the page where you that. I'm actually going to jump in and show you what it looks like. Um, we control this from Enterprise Control. But the good thing is, um, moving forward, if there's changes or things we need to add to the drop down menus, we can do that. So this page can continue to be tweaked. Yeah, so pretty much just like Justin said, you have the ability to fill in all of this information, a student's preference, their requested time frame for that preference, the date that they want it effective. You've got this little notes field you can put down who requested. Internet and residence the type of that access, and then device information as well. And another little notes field, and then finally a option for paper learning packets. 
um, if they have a preference there, and then any additional comments. Let's, yeah, go ahead and submit, and I'm going to have you go back to the screen. Oops, let me, sorry, rehide some things that should not be. <laughs> All right. Um, while he's doing that, I will share. I wish we could have got this out earlier. We know you needed this back in July, August, but the soonest, because this is another state reporting state compliance project, um, it's rolled out monthly. So we got it out just as soon as we could. And to be honest, we thought it'd be October before we got this to you. Um, there we go. One thing I've been asked already is, can we display? So you'll notice there on the student learning preferences screen, not in the pop-up box, that it only lists the effective date, learning preferences, requested time frame, and one other. I don't know what's behind John's window there, but somebody has already asked if we could get um, everything displayed there. So we'll go back and ask what all can be displayed on that page. But just know if you click on that effective date, it takes you to the pop-up that John just had where you can see all of the details. Um, another thing I'll point out is this, um, go ahead and click on that drop down of the blended, where we have blended. So these are the items we pushed out. Um, you've got on-site blended and remote virtual. We tried to kind of use what we've got in calendar membership day types, because right now I think this, those three sum up what's going on in the state of North Carolina right now. We can add to it if needed later on, but yeah, for now, that's our options. The requested time frame is another one we could tweak. We tried to put everything in there that we saw in schedules that existed. If not, send us an email and we'll add. If you've got other kind of terms other than what you see listed there, just shoot me an email. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is this is not required. DPI is not collecting any information from this as of now. We put this out there for your use, also knowing that later on there's a chance that we might be collecting this data. So for this year, it's just there for you to use as you will wish. John, can, can you do me a favor, John? Um, sure that Justin was going to go there anyway. You're going there. Go, go for it. Yes, so I saw the question in the chat, and it's a great question. Can you import and export this information? The answer is yes. Um, so these fields are accessible through Data Export Manager and Data Import Manager. Um, so, and I will show you guys what the table is real quick. So your category is going to be a database extension, and then your table is going to be S Stu Learning Pref C. Um, and once you select that, here are all the fields from the learning preferences, and you can join those with the students table as well. Awesome. Yeah, I'm seeing several questions come in about well, what if we already created custom fields, or if you've been doing it your way. And that's fine. You can continue using your custom field if you wish, or since he's just shown you how to export, import, then you could probably just export out what you have and put it on this page if you want. Totally up to you this year. Anything you want to add, Rob, John, anything we missed? I, I, I think that's very good. We hope that this is very beneficial for you. This is good because it's a standalone page. It's not really tied to anything. Um, so I believe that this can be very beneficial for you. I do want to reiterate what Justin said. As of right now, we put this out there for you because this was a request that came in that this information was needed. We understand uh, it could have been sooner, but we got this out there pretty quickly considering how fast everything happened once the idea was formed. However, what I can't promise you is once others figure out this page is out there that this doesn't become required. So again, we'll communicate that out. But right now it is not required and this is here for you to use. Thank you. Thank you. All right.
Okay. We will. John, how, do you think we'll have the QRD ready by Friday? Uh, yeah, definitely. I just wanted to stick some screenshots in it, and otherwise, I think we're good to go. So. Um, there was one item I meant to have you click on, but one of those that said internet and residence or inter internet access. When we were going through this with PowerSchool, I don't know if you saw it when he was clicking through it, but it says internet not affordable. <laughs> at first, I asked him to leave that out of the drop down list because I was looking at it thinking the family may not can afford internet. But in Texas, what they intended that to mean is internet's available in the area, but it's not a an affordable internet. It's a very expensive internet. And so I told them to leave it because we've been asked some questions over the years that I think if we start collecting that, that might be good information to have. The number that you live out in the country and internet's $200 a month. So that may help us later on. So that's what that means. Don't think that <laughs> we put it in there for the other reason. Okay. <clears throat> GPA lockdown project, this is one that's been in the works for over a year. You've probably already seen it. We presented it, we had it in QA, and we uh, gave you a demo of it last year when we were on the road, but this is coming in July of 2021. We've gotten to go ahead, so go ahead and start advertising it. Far and wide, we want you to share this with as many people as you can so that come July, nobody's shocked that we're gonna lock down this historical grade screen. Um, you're aware that when you set up your NC 10 point scale and the courses are pulled in that all of the GPA points added values, all that good stuff's already assigned. And it works pretty good unless you go back and edit this screen or unless you manually enter grades like transfer credits and stuff like that. Um, I imagine at the next meetup, we'll be able to do another demo with you and show, show you the, the screen and how it works. Right now, there were a few things that I've asked Lorenzo to go back and change. So we've got a couple of tickets in that he's working on. Simple items that I think will be fixed by the winter meetup. But just be sure to tell everybody that come July of 2021, after we go through EOI, um, many things on this page will be locked down. And by locked down, I mean, um, you know, like course number. If you put in a course number, I'm having them automatically populate the course name. If you put in wrong GPA points or added values, um, it's going to go back and look at the grade and percentage to make sure that you put the correct GPA point. So you can't put in the grade of an 80 and a 4.0 GPA. The system, when you click submit, will change it to a 3.0. So we're doing this to try to help with the, the errors that are being created that we see on the daily. <laughs> we've, got, we've got somebody on our team who's pulled that and kind of done a quick audit. Well, I don't want to say quick an intense audit, and it is crazy what we're finding out there. So we're hoping that this will help um, clean things up. It'll also help when a student transfers into your district. You'll know that you're more likely receiving some cleaner data than you used to. So go ahead and start letting everybody know this is happening. We've been asked to get this out to as many people as we can. And then next time we meet, we'll, we'll be able to do a demo with you. All right. Next slide. All right. These are some items, and there may be other items that some folks on the call here might want to add to this, but these are some data entry problems that we've seen since day one of school. Um, I'll go down through the list there. Sue Ann might want to chime in on some. Tessa, you might want to throw some items in. But the dual enrolled students, duly enrolled students is one. I've got an extract and I haven't been able to reach out to all the districts yet, but we are finding that now more than ever, we've got students sitting in two different PSUs. And it's because you, a lot of us are remote learning and teacher A may assume that little Johnny's doing his homework, but he's over in another district doing the homework for teacher B. So we know that's going on, we know that's a problem, but we've got a lot of them this year. We've pulled the data and I've got to share it out, but we'll be sending some kind of reports out to the districts if you've got students that are sitting in other districts. So we know that's a problem. Entry exit dates, this is part of what's causing some PMR issues. If we've got some dates that are flipped the wrong way, reverse enrollments, we're seeing a lot of those. Student field value updates, this is a big one. 
we've dealt with this more times this year. Well, I don't think I've ever dealt with this problem, but for some reason now we've got a lot of districts who are going back, doing some cleanup of schedules, calendar changes. And if you set the student field value, if you go through student field value or DDA and you make the entry and exit date or the start and exit date of the class match, then those records are gone from the CC table. So we've had two or three districts now that's wiped out every schedule for all students because they made this change, CC records disappeared, then there's no history to the schedule. So we have to do backups in order to keep you from having to hand schedule your whole district. Rob, do you want to add to that one? Because I know this is one you wanted to. Yeah, I, I do want to add to that. The, number one, if, if you're in there doing that type of work, one of the best things you can do and should do is export out all the data you're working with to make sure you have a clean copy before you do that. And please also understand one thing that I would ask you to do is if you do this, and, or you have something like this happen where you're you're wiping out massive amount of records. Call PowerSchool right away. Don't chat with them. Don't shoot them an email. Call them and say, I just screwed up five minutes ago. I need some help. I would much rather have that than to hear about it a couple days later. So please, if you have something major like that, Tell everybody. I don't care if you tell um, PowerSchool and then call us. We just need to make sure we're, we are notified so that we can help get that there as quickly as possible. So I would ask that you do one of two things, or actually both of these things. Export out first before you start working with the records you're clearing and cleaning. And then if you make a mistake, please call PowerSchool. Don't do the chat. Please call PowerSchool. They will let us know, and then we'll work with you to get it back as quickly as possible. But but that's really the big one. So I, I understand we all want the records to be correct. We all want it right, and we all need to do the cleanup, and we've all done things like that before. But we just need to make sure that we make people aware when something big occurs like that. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, and Power School to ask that we really reiterate what Rob just shared. And the quicker you get that to them, the better. And chat is not the way to go with big items like that. If you need a if you need a restart or a restore rather, don't send that through the chat. Just call everybody. Um, exit reason, Sue Ann, do you want to speak to this? I added this for your request. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me yet? Hello? Yes. Okay. When ECATS runs the summer withdrawals, um, we had 1,250 students that had no exit reason. There was no W1, no W2, none of that. It's very important that that gets added when you exit a student from your, data, uh, from your database or your LEA or PSU now. Um, they will exit from ECAT, but if they ever come back, it's going to cause a major problem to try and go back and fix that. And if they're an EC student, it does not allow you the access to put in the EC exit reason. So that must be there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next slide. Um, real quick, and I know it feels like we're rushing, but I needed to leave an hour to end for Sue Ann for the CEU credits. But the PowerSchool upgrade, we are going to do a real quick demo here. I've put a link to the release notes here. The 20.4 release notes are out. 20.44 is probably the version that we'll be on once we upgrade. And just to go ahead and let you know, uh, we're looking at a winter upgrade. So December, January timeframe, we hope. Um, there's a lot of priorities in the agency. Um, Given our QA setup, it's kind of hard to test what needs to be tested um, with the upgrade in place at the same time. So we're trying to knock some items out before we can get an instance with the upgrade on it. But this is this is our target date, January, December, January. And then John did have a few.
few items he wanted to show you that was kind of neat. Um, I don't know if you've got that pulled up, John. Yes. Yeah, I just, I kind of wanted everyone to see this really pretty new start page because I was so excited when I saw this for the first time. Um, so it's not like insanely different, right? But they've got this cool quick data dashboard over here on the side that will show you at a glance kind of what's going on. Um, and I love this updated search too, so you can kind of combine filters. Um, so like if I have my 12th graders and then I want the boys, but maybe now I want all boys, I can X out that 12th grade. So, I don't know. I just thought it was really neat and worth showing you guys. Yep, definitely much cleaner looking. So, as we get more details on that, I'll share them out. But I did want to have the release notes so that you could read through them and see what's coming. There are several items that we know are big, um, big wins as far as functionality. Some of the things that you've been asking for for a while are in there. So, just read through the release notes when you can. And we'll we'll have this as an item of discussion at our next meetup as well. All right. All right. Student contacts migration. So here's where we are. Um, we're still on track to have all North Carolina instances moved over to core contacts come January 2021. The survey results that we got back, Tessa was right. We've got a whole lot of dist districts that even though we've told you to keep it in both. Um, core and custom. We've got a whole lot of folks that they're not using the custom. So we want to get you there as quick as we can, knowing that. Our next move is to send out a survey because you know a lot of districts are done and they're ready to move to core only. But then we've got several districts I know that are out there that need help. So we're going to send out a survey to, to ask what your training needs or what kind of assistance you need from DPI. And then we'll go from there on setting up sessions to work with you to make sure that everybody in the state can move to the core contacts by January. Um, I listed there because it's asked every time we mention student contacts, what is DPI, um, wh what reports is looking at the custom contacts? These are the only three that we know of, TIMS, ECATS, and the auto dialer. And I know ECATS was already, they're in the works of getting ready to move over as well. So they're doing that work. We've got to work with Power School on the TIMS part, but we expect that we'll have our items complete by then. So just be on the lookout for the survey to let us know what you need us to help you with to meet this deadline. Next slide. I'm two minutes late, but wanted to definitely throw in this spotlight. Um, many of you know that we've got the user board that we meet with every Wednesday during lunch. Um, so these folks here listed, um, they serve on the Power School User Board. They meet with Rob and I and Tess and John. They meet with us every Wednesday at noon for about an hour, sometimes longer, to kind of come through the ideas that they're seeing, share those with us, and then we run the things that we're doing at DPI by them. So these people give us a lot of feedback, assist us in many, many ways, but just know that they're out there helping you guys, and if you have something that you want expressed to us that may not be getting to us directly, you can probably contact any of the people here in the slide, and they'll bring it up with us on our Wednesday call. So thank oh, you guys yeah. for serving. And and can I add to that, Justin? Sure. Um, these folks have brought things to our attention that we have made changes on almost immediately, um, and and I am very thankful so for these folks, and I tell them that. Um, but th their voice is being heard, and we're doing everything we can to make a lot of what they're noticing happen because of the fact that um, it's it's helping us understand better what's going on in the field. So thank you very much. All right, next slide. Before I turn it over to Sue Ann, I do want to point out um, there's a link there, and this is imported into. Uh, Google Docs. So I put that there so that you have it, but Sue Ann is going to also share out her, her slideshow. So the formatting may look a little bit different. And then the last thing I want to say before I give it to her is that um, at the end, there's a feedback link that you have to complete to get the CEU credit.
So be sure you stick around, get the link for the feedback, and then you'll get your CEU once you provide feedback. All right, so then I don't know if you want to take over. Yeah, I'm going to have to. Um... So, man, while we're transitioning, I just want to thank you again for coming. This has been, I think, long overdue, and a lot of people are very interested in this topic, so I am very appreciative of you for doing this. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me because there's a lot of questions in the field from Power School that really need to be answered. So that's what we're going to talk about right now is authoritative sources, when files are pulled, um, who should be responsible, and how we figure things out. So we're going to get started. The first thing we're going to talk about is the system data imports. We're going to talk about the data source, how often it gets pulled, and the process for updating that data. So authoritative data source. PowerSchool is the authoritative data source for everything except EC data. EC data authoritative source is ECATS. So we want to be sure we remember that. These are the files that get pulled in their frequency. The daily files, we pull students, schools, parents, parent addresses, student addresses, and LEA users. Now keep in mind those parents and parents' addresses are still coming from the North Carolina contact screen. Um, at the time we started the process, this was the only screen that had the proper information and the required relationship uh, to be pulled into ECAT. Those are pulled daily, and the daily pull starts at 8 p.m. Now, keep in mind that there are other things that sometimes interfere with that daily pull. So, if you enroll a student before 8 and he doesn't show up, wait till the next day because it may be that something interfered with that daily pull to get that student to come over. On a weekly basis, we pull your calendar days and your day length. That day length is important for the L, um, LRE, or Least Restrictive Environment, for students. So we want to make sure that you update that. Monthly, we pull your school year and your reporting periods. I know there's some questions about reporting periods, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Annually, once certified, we, pull, we will pull the fall assessments, and then certified, we will pull the spring assessments. There's a one-time pull that we're going to pull assessment archives. So all the assessment archives we're going to pull. Now, ECATS will send back some files. They send them back to PowerSchool, to CEDARS, and to Accountability and others. Daily, we send back the EC student data file that goes on that EC page. Right now, we are having an issue with PowerSchool accepting that data file and updating it as it should. Lorenzo, our wonderful Lorenzo, who works on everything, is working on it and looking at it. We're trying our best to get it fixed. But keep in mind that ECATS is the authoritative source for that EC data. So don't depend on PowerSchool to have what you need right now. Weekly. Uh, we send to accountability the EC basics and the EC accommodations. And three times a year to CEDARS, we send students, student snapshot, and then special ed information. Those all come out of ECATS. Corrections and updates must be made in that authoritative source. So anything except for EC information has to be corrected in PowerSchool. Our school information travels from ECAS on the schedule, which I just showed you that schedule with demographics, um, data traveling nightly except for Saturdays. No files are pulled on Saturdays, they're pulled on Friday, and then they begin again on Sunday. That file adds new students, it upgrades demographics, and it triggers a student record transfer. We've had lots of problems with the student record transfer because of data in PowerSchool, and we'll go over that data in just a couple minutes and talk about it. EC data travels back to PowerSchool nightly, except again for Saturdays, because no data is pulled on Saturdays. And of course, this updates the um, EC data screen, where you used to have to check, yes, they were EC, but you no longer have to do that. 
This is where we're going to talk about some of the possible errors that are caused by um, things in PowerSchool. Duplicate students, incorrect dates, transfer of EC data in ECATS, no race or ethnicity, no student ID, no school code, is LEP, parent information, and we're going to talk a little bit about staff information and one that we didn't get added on here because we found it after this was already sent up was the no withdrawal code. So that W1, W, whatever has to be there. Duplicate students is a major issue. And as you know, there were a bunch of those that were out there before we ever started ECATS. And we have been working, or PowerSchool has been working on getting those down. Um, but the process is, that it must be corrected in all systems, PowerSchool and Student UID, before it can ever be corrected in ECATS. So once a duplicate student or students that are mixed up are located in ECATS, that EC designee will contact the PowerSchool PSU coordinator or their data manager who will then contact the coordinator and provide you with the information, the two numbers that they've got, what they can see in ECATS that needs to be corrected. You will then send, or PowerSchool will then send, a ticket to PowerSchool Service Desk. The only time that a ticket does not need to be sent to PowerSchool Service Desk is if you go into the state staff UID system and it's already, one of them is already an invalid number. If it says duplicate, do not use, that ticket still needs to go to PowerSchool. PowerSchool will then take care of the duplicate as they're supposed to. They will send a ticket to the DPI service desk. The DPI service desk will send me that ticket with how PowerSchool resolved the issue, and I will then have it corrected in ECATS. When you give PowerSchool that ticket and you get that ticket number back, please give that to the EC designee because what they will do is log a ticket to PowerSchool, uh, to, excuse me, to ECATS, our Zendesk ECATS logging system, with all the information and that ticket number. That ticket will come to me and I will hold on to that ticket until it is resolved in PowerSchool. The reason it's done this way now is because the service desk is keeping a list of all the students that are going to be archived. And it must go through PowerSchool and be put on that list before it will ever get archived. I'm not sure when that's going to happen, but at least we have a running list of those that should be archived. Okay. Incorrect dates. This has been a major problem this year. It causes all kinds of errors in ECAS. It does not allow us to transfer records. It does not allow the student record automated system to transfer records. If you have some errors, students missing from, uh, from, your power, from your PSU, students transfer records does not occur. Students are not active in ECAT, so there's no way the records can occur. To eliminate errors, the following must be done in PowerSchool. Student entry and withdrawal dates must be in the proper order. In this case, if you had a student who entered on 826 and exited on 925, that's fine. It's correct. No entry date in PowerSchool should ever be before the exit in the other school. So let's say you have a student who enters your um, school or LEA on 826 and exits on 925. The new school entry, if it is 920, is incorrect. You cannot enter a new school until you exit the old school. So the entry for the new school should be 926, or you should contact the previous school and have them to correct their data if the child actually showed up to your school on 920. Now, when you push that transfer student records button, you should be able to see the previous LEA's entry and exit dates if the record comes over. When you see that, don't just correct it at your LEA. It's got to be corrected at the withdrawing LEA in order for the data to, 
take place in ECATS. There are some more errors. No exit date can go into the next school year unless your school ends on June 30th. Then your exit date would be 7-1, and we all know that this has to do with attendance tracking. So if you have an entry date of 7-1 and an exit date of 7-21, unless your school ends on 6-30, that's incorrect, okay? Entry of 7-1 and exit of 6-15, you can't exit last school year if you have an entry of this school year. So those need corrected. And this is one that I have found is a major problem this year, summer withdrawals. You can have an entry of 7-6, and an exit of 7.30, that's correct. You can have an entry of 7.6 and an exit of 7.6, that's correct. Now what I do wanna remind you is, either one of those will work in ECAT, but what you need to keep in mind is that the exit date you are provided in your EOI document, and typically is the same entry and the same exit date. So those would need to be, if you had the student entering on 8.17, when you actually exit them, you would need to correct that entry date also to do the summer withdrawal with the date that EOI speaks of. What I've seen a lot this year is an entry of 817, excuse me, my phone's ringing, and an exit of 715, which is incorrect because you cannot exit a school before you ever enter. So you wanna be sure that, you know, just a second. Okay, I think it's done. You want to be sure that you correct that entry if the exit is 715 or use the entry and exit date that's provided to you in the EOI document. Records will not transfer in ECADS if the dates are out of order. And then what happens is they send it to us we have to send back and say, well, the dates are out of order. Person will come to you. Well, you've already fixed your entry and exit within your transfer records, but that does not work. These errors must be corrected at the withdrawing school because that's where the exit information is pulled from. Once that's corrected, then it has to come back to ECATS in order for us to do a manual transfer because those dates are not updated in ECATS. So there's like four tickets that transfer back and forth if these dates are wrong. So we gotta make sure that when we exit those students, we have accurate exit and entry dates. No student left in the FTE school. If you leave students in the FTE school, they will not show up in their next school. There is a section in the EOI document that walks you through or tells you what you need to do with those students who you have in the FTE school. So for this school year, you should have nobody left in your FTE school. You wanna make sure that you go through and correct those. Um, there's some reminders, of course, always withdrawal. You always have to have that withdrawal reason, the W1 or W2 or whatever you need to put in there so that if it's an EC student, this will allow the EC division to be able to put in the EC exit reason, which is required for federal reporting, which is federal dollars. So you wanna be sure that you have that. An exit date from an LEA cannot come before the entry date. An entry date into a new LEA cannot come before the exit date at the withdrawing LEA. Data must be corrected in that withdrawing school when the dates are incorrect. Please remember to push that transfer student data button when you enroll a new student in your LEA. It's important that you do that so that all the accommodations, all the history, all the EC data will come over. And I know there's a question about something about this um, later on, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Transfer EC student data. Power school users need to get used to that, pushing that transfer student record button. Students' names must match exactly. We are crossing our fingers and hoping 
that the new um, official name that goes into PowerSchool will help with this. But if students' names do not match, their records won't transfer in ECATS. We're working with PowerSchool and the ECATS vendor to try and make this more similar to um, what's pulled for state student UID. We're taking out the middle name and putting in the date of birth. So hopefully that will reduce some of the problems that we have with names. One school could have John Henry. One school could have John Thomas Henry. One school could have John, John Thomas Henry Jr. Those records will not transfer. So at some point, there would have to be three manual transfers done in order to get those records to the active LEA that the student is in now so that all the EC data will be there for the, for the EC people. You must have an ethnicity, a student ID, and a school code. And is LEP must be there. The race and ethnicity, of course, is required, which typically you don't leave that out, but you got to make sure that you do get that in there. One student ID is required, so that's what we do when we have the duplicate students. We take care of that. School code must be present. FTE is not a school that is used for federal reporting, so you cannot leave students in that FTE school. If a student is LEP, it must be corrected in PowerSchool and marked as is LEP. I'm not sure where this goes now. At one point, I knew when I was doing PowerSchool, but your PowerSchool people can help you figure that one out. Parent information. This has been a real issue, um, and hopefully the new course screen will solve the problem. Right now, it's being pulled from the NC student contact page. It must be entered under new contacts. I know you see the parents at the top, but that's pulled from a different place, and it does not have the required relationship data with it where it comes from. So it must be entered after that new context on that North Carolina context page. So if your EC people say they're not getting their parents, that's why. And um, they need them to put on the team. They need them for several other things to send emails. So until that new core contact screen goes in and is official and the NC contact screen is closed, we're going to use that NC contact screen because they're still working on, like, Justin said, people updating that core screen. So we cannot depend on it to have the required information for us. The EC data that comes back to PowerSchool from ECATS, of course you notice that that EC is EC is gone. It's now the EC designated course of study for a student. You've got to have a primary disability, a secondary disability, a plan, environmental setting, program start, program end date, exit date, and exit reason. Now, when you hit that transfer student record button, the data from the previous LEA is going to come into your EC data screen. It will have an exit date and an exit reason for when they left and why they left the previous LEA. Once a student has a active IEP, at the new LEA, which can happen overnight if the records transfer and the dates and everything are set up correctly, the exit date and exit reason should be removed and all the data should be accurate. Again, there is an issue, so do not depend on this EC data screen right now to be accurate. Make sure you always check ECAT. Everybody ask, can the EC icon go away? That EC icon will stay if the student is currently or was previously enrolled in PowerSchool, and you have to look at the ands and the ors here, and on the PowerSchool EC screen, they have a primary disability field. They have an EC services begin date that is on or before the date you're viewing that EC data, and the EC exit date and exit reason are empty. Or on the PowerSchool EC data screen, they've got that primary disability 
and an EC services begin and end date, and the exit date contains a date and one of the following EC reasons, the DI, the DO, the GR, the MV, MA, or CP, you will notice that there's two reasons that are not here, which is the transferred to regular ed or the consent revoked. Those are the only two reasons that take that green power school icon off of a student's file. It stays there no matter what, unless it's those two reasons for data information for following schools. So remember that when you see that icon, even if there is exit information, that icon should still be there unless there's any other reason other than the ones that you see here. Staff into ECATS. There's been a lot of issues with this, and here's what a staff must have in order to show up and use ECATS. They must be in that state staff UID system and on the vocational tab, the district is required, the active is required to say yes, the school code is required, hire date you can leave blank, but beside annual salary, there must be an object purpose code. If that staff member is to be involved in ECAT, then the first three digits of that seven digit value will be, need to be accurate. There is a document on the ECATS website in the Monday messages on December the 2nd that gives you a list of the current object codes that must be pulled. We don't worry about the pro uh, purpose code for us, but all seven digits must be there or it won't pull accurately. So if someone comes to you, these are the things, first things that they need to look for to make sure that that student, or student, excuse me, that user is going to show up in ECATS. And this is basically what it looks like. There you have your hire date, your annual salary, and that's what you must have. And that's what we find is missing 99% of the time is that annual salary object purpose code. So you want to make sure, and you want to make sure that there's an email address. Now, that email address can come from PowerSchool, and this is the order it looks for it. PowerSchool, that link file that's sent and from HR. The HR payroll people should be able to help you or help EC people figure out what that annual salary object code should be. Um, they are the ones who generally take care of that state staff UID system. So you wanna work with those. Here's some ECATS resources. Of course, there's the, you know, the special education user manual. Um, system overview, there is a ton of videos out there that you can look at, somebody ask you, or even if you just want some general information and need to know, and there's some training topics for you. Those links should work from the uh, place where Justin has posted this webinar. We also have within ECATS the service documentation module. That allows nurses to um, document the services that they give within ECAT. It's not a billing system, it's just a documentation system. And here's some information for that. I don't know if you all are getting a lot of questions about that right now, because typically it's the EC person who they would go to, and then the EC person would come and speak to you all. We all know that MTSS is coming. Not sure of the exact date yet, but the files that they pull, here's the the pattern that they pull those. And if you'll notice the daily files, a lot of them are exactly the same as the daily files for EC. Weekly files, there's a couple that are the same, except we have available LEA course list, of course the students' courses or their schedule, teachers' courses schedule, and attendance. Attendance is pulled weekly. Monthly, we've got school years, we've got reporting periods the North Carolina course list, GPA, the assessments of WAPT, grade, and incidents are pulled. Annually, of course, is the fall and the spring or summer assessments. Assessment access and retentions are pulled. And one time, of course, again, there's that um, assessment archive pull. 
Here's some MTSS resources for you if you'd like to get information on that. We have on the ECATS website a Monday message archive. Remember I talked about that December 2nd Monday message? You can go back to ECATS website here and get those object codes that are pulled currently for ECATS. If you have an object code that you feel needs to be pulled, go to your ECATS designee within your LEA who can log Zendesk tickets and actually have them log a ticket to DPI. Uh, not to DPI, to Zendesk through the ticketing system. There's a frequently asked questions document. Unfortunately, there's no phone service for ECATS. All the tickets must go through the vendor to supply technical support. There's a ticketing system within ECATS, which is called Zendesk. Um, they receive all EC tickets or all questions about ECATS. They handle some of those. Some of those they forward on to me and I take care of. And that's how a lot of the EC people know that there's an issue with PowerSchool. If the ticket comes to me and I do the investigating and let them know where the issue is. All the tickets for EC must go through that, okay? And they must be submitted by a local ECATS designee. There should be or could be up to five of those designees within your LEA. There may not be, but there could be up to five. We're gonna look at the questions that you submitted not too long ago and see if we can answer some of them for you and then see if there are any others. What is ECAT? Every Child Accountability and Tracking System. And it's every child because every child that is within PowerSchool in the state of North Carolina is pulled into ECATS. Unlike CCAS, where we only had the EC students, this system houses all students. Well, EC accommodations feed to PowerSchool. Yes, um, if you're speaking about that EC data screen, they should transfer nightly, but at this time, you know we're still having that issue with PowerSchool not accepting that file properly. So hopefully within the next month, <laughs> I'm saying month, hopefully it'll be sooner. We get that fixed, um, but always, always remember, ECATS is the authoritative source for that EC data. So you cannot depend on PowerSchool to be accurate. I just want to understand the general functionality, where data pulls from, et cetera. Um, you have a link to the webinar, Justin has given you that, and the data, how it's pulled and when it's pulled was listed in the first part of this webinar or this PowerPoint, really. ECATS needs to understand until PowerSchool can transfer the student records in from previous districts. We don't have a magic button to make previous, and there was nothing else, but data managers have to wait on districts to release. At this time, we're unaware that there's any problem with that transfer record button. I know there was before, but we've understand that it's working properly. If you have an issue with it, you need to log that ticket to PowerSchool. If you get the message when you push that button that the student won't transfer because they're still enrolled in their previous PSU, that's a key that EC records will not transfer either and that somebody needs to contact that previous uh, PSU and make sure that they withdraw that student and withdraw them correctly. Again, we talked about that EC status. The only time that record is removed is when there's two of those reasons in the exit reason that are listed. All other times, that green icon stays with that child. So it cannot be removed. Is there a way to print accommodations form by test? Um, I've not found that way yet. <laughs> I keep looking. There is a way that you can print the report that comes in Excel in a spreadsheet, so you can filter it. But to just print it by test like you could in CCAS, I have not found that yet. When students are transferring in from another North Carolina public school and the exit date and exit reason is really the transfer date and the transfer reason, why does it not come out? It should. 
if PowerSchool accepts the transfer entry file or transfer data file correctly. Remember, when it transfers from another LEA and you push that button, all the data from that other LEA, the previous LEA, comes into your school. That includes the exit reason and the exit date from that previous LEA. Once the record transfers in ECATS, now with all those other errors that we talked about, it could be several days before that transfer gets done because we have to have a ticket, we have to investigate, we have to figure out why it's not transferring, it may have to come back to you. But once that student has an active IEP within that LEA, all paperwork's done, it's active, then the file should bring from ECATS into PowerSchool the record for the current IEP and take those reason dates of and exit dates off of that file. But keep in mind, it may not happen the very next day. Why is ECATS insisting that PowerSchool create individual terms in our years and terms for reporting periods? What you put into PowerSchool for reporting periods is a PowerSchool or a PSU decision. We understand that there is a problem right now and we have escalated those concerns about the progress report to PCG, which is our vendor, and we're waiting on a response for them. Um, hopefully soon we'll have it resolved so that, that they will stop asking, but if they have a problem, they need to actually log a ticket or speak to their um, policy person at their, at their LEA. Attendance recognition of EC students. I'm not sure what's being asked. So if you ask that question, go ahead and put it in the chat and someone can let me know. What is the role of the school data manager? For ECATS, the role of the school data manager is to ensure that all data in PowerSchool is correct. And also, just to help your EC people correct those errors or find student data to ensure that both systems are accurate. Um, some of the EC people have never used PowerSchool. They've never been in PowerSchool. So what they see they think is wrong is actually not. It's correct. So your, your job as a data manager is just to make sure PowerSchool is accurate and just to kind of help and guide those EC data managers um, through the data. How will the LEP testing accommodations entered into ECATS? LEP accommodations are entered into PowerSchool or the accountability testing system unless the student is EC. If the student is EC, then the IEP accommodations contain all the accommodations for the state test. So if they're EC, they should come in that way. When registering a new student, I used to have to go into PowerSchool and update some fields indicating EC, so the EC icon would display. Now, all data on the EC data screen should come from ECATS. One more time, we have that problem right now, so don't depend on that. You want to make sure that you shouldn't have to go into PowerSchool and change any of that data. If the EC personnel is able to see all student information in ECATS, why do they need PowerSchool access? What type of security settings should they have in PowerSchool? EC does not require access to PowerSchool. But keep in mind that PowerSchool is the authoritative source for all information except for that EC information. EC users may need to maintain records in the 292 school for students that are continuing or contained in the EC program school. That's that 292 school that's at your LEA. A couple of files are attendance and incidents that come into ECATS. Attendance information is only pulling absences and incidents is not pulling any confidential information. So the ECAT user may need to view information in PowerSchool to make an informal decision or make a formal decision about the student's instruction. Because remember with MTSS, it's, it's about learning and you know, differentiated learning. So you want to make sure that they're able to get all the information they need. The access that you assign them is totally up to you. Um, as, a, as a unit, as a PowerSchool unit, um, we cannot tell you what access to give them. Is it possible to run a report in PowerSchool to get active current EC students? I will defer that one to Justin and Tessa. Um, I think there may be some documents on the EC 
uh, not the EC, the Power School website that could help you with that, but they'll be able to give you more information on that. What information is pulled from the North Carolina contact screen into ECAT? Any data that's typed below the new user screen or new contact screen is pulled. Anything on the top of the screen does not get pulled. Is there a way that our district can correct mistakes made in previous power school units? No, you cannot go to a previous LEA and correct their data. Students with multiple names and ID numbers transfer across multiple power school units, causing confusion as to which name is correct. This is true. This is one of the things that I was talking about. If you have a student that has five different names, two different numbers, all of that needs to be corrected through PowerSchool so that we can make sure everything is accurate. Can EC teachers get student data out of ECAT? Yes, teachers can get certain data out of ECATS if they have the user rights that allow them to see the students or are connected to the students. They may need data that's not available to them in ECATS. As to why somebody keeps coming to you, that I can't answer. Um, if, you, if they've got questions that you need answered, Talk to your EC designee and have them send in a ticket and maybe we can figure out what the issue is and help you get that resolved. They're asking, what are the EC people being told about the relationship between ECATS and PowerSchool? This is not being conveyed to EC people. They've been instructed that PowerSchool is the authoritative source for all data except for that EC data. There's usually an EC data manager or an EC director that works directly with ECATS. Um, so I'm not sure who's asking the question. Um, if it's a teacher, you need to redirect them to their EC data manager or to their EC um, director so that they can get the information they need. The sequence for, for um, the system to function for EC teachers. For ECATS, you must enter that person into the state staff UID system. They must be attached to your LEA. They must have active set to yes. And this is the important thing that everybody misses. Contract users or contract employees can be put into the state staff UID system. There's directions on that on the, the um, DPI website but they must have that object purpose code, which is seven digit number. Um, those certain object codes that are being pulled into ECATS, you can find on that December 2nd Monday message, and they must have an email address. The other question was about user types. The ECATS user types have nothing to do with the user roles in PowerSchool. They're two separate things and they are not connected in any way whatsoever. This is the question that we talked about about the reporting terms. In ECATS, we're pulling the scheduling terms, which in essence ends up being your reporting terms. For EC students, the issue becomes that an IEP may require progress reports during a reporting period at different times. So let's say an IEP says in three weeks, every three weeks a student must have a progress report. ECATS right now can only handle one final report per reporting period. So that's why a lot of them have been asking you to add those extra progress report times, but don't do that. Um, we've escalated this concern to PCG and we're waiting on a response. We've also informed the, the EC person who's over this that at this point, it cannot be done in PowerSchool. It can, but there's just too much involved. And so this year, nothing is going to happen with that. Just ask them to refer back to their EC um, policy person. Again, here's some questions for PowerSchool that I'm gonna <clears throat> defer to them. Again, a PowerSchool question. Um, I don't know if y'all wanna answer this after I finish. But why do I have an eCATS application button on my EdCloud main screen? What am I supposed to be doing and how am I to log in? 
ECADS is part of the single sign-on system just like Canvas and NESIS. Therefore, you're going to have that icon in your NC Ed Cloud screen. If you do not have the proper user type in ECATS, or you're not up, set up correctly in the state staff UID system, if you click on it, you're not going to be able to get in or to see anything. You want to make sure <clears throat> that you talk to somebody at your LEA to see if you're supposed to have access. That would be your designee, but that's a power school um, LEA decision. We can't tell you who should be and who shouldn't be in ECATS, but what you will see is that icon, just like you see several other icons on your um, IAM or your EdCloud login screen. It will be there. Ask about error messages that point the EC person to a PowerSchool problem. There are no error messages that point the EC person to a PowerSchool problem. Typically, they would submit a Zendesk ticket, and it would be checked for where the error lies. If the information is found to be within PowerSchool, then they will be instructed to come to you. Um, typically, they come to me, the tickets come to me, or to Stephanie, which Stephanie's on the line with me right now, Stephanie Lowry, and we investigate those tickets, figure out where the error lies, and then send that answer back to the EC person who may end up coming to you. Somebody wants to know where ECATS is and if it's a PowerSchool application. No, ECATS replaces the CCAS for um, EC data. The ECATS system is the authoritative source for that EC data and has a service documentation module and the MTSS module. Right now, you only see the ECATS, um, the EC service module, EC data module, and the service documentation module. MTSS will be coming soon. It has nothing to do with PowerSchool except that PowerSchool is the authoritative source for everything except that EC data. And like I said before, the icon's gonna be there because it's just a part of the state of North Carolina single, single log on system. Duplicate students, we went over that in the beginning so you can refer back to that screen that talks about the process for duplicate students. Remember the only time a ticket does not go to PowerSchool is if one of those student ID numbers already says retired or something like that in the state student UID system and you cannot get to that number. What does ECATS not really call contacts? Okay, what? this is that North Carolina contact screen. We use that screen because it had the required information that was necessary for ECATS. Also, you may need to remember that you need to put that information below on the new contact screen it has to be typed in as soon as the authoritative source which is PowerSchool uses the core screen and disconnects the NC contact screen we will be using that we've already started working on the process to transfer that over um, but it will be the NC contact screen until PowerSchool disconnects that screen and says the core screen is the authoritative source Someone's asking if they can't stop requesting EC kids hard copies from previous schools. I did ask the EC division this, and this is their answer. No, because the hard copy is the authoritative source for information that may or may not be populated into ECAT. This will be important now because consistency plans or contingency plans are not uploaded to ECAT. Once the records transfer in ECATS, the teacher or the person may be able to see the information, not necessarily all the information, but this may not be the total information. At some point, we may be able to depend on the electronic copy, but that day's not arrived yet. So you have to go ahead and continue to request those records. And that is what I have for you. Rob, do you have any questions? I don't, I do not, but it looks like the chat room has been full of questions. So I think what we might, what we might want to do is go back and um, try to decipher those questions and maybe put out, I, I believe after the last meetup, we put a um, QRD out there or an FAQ about frequently asked questions that came up. Um, and we just need to take some time to look at those questions and maybe put something together, including the power school questions that are, are in front of us here. That um, works, and if you'll just I, 
If you'll just get those to me, I'll be more than happy to help you decipher those. Can you can you go back to some of your screens um, about the data flow? It was one of the first screens you did. Um, yeah. Come yeah. in, yeah, right there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that it was important to know, um, I understand that there was a lot of information here to where it sounds like um, you, you guys need to do things a little differently in Power School and we have some data to correct. I, I think we should all be shooting for clean data and some things I understand are out of your control that sometimes a district will send a kid and they said they withdrew on this date when you had that kid sitting in your classrooms for five days prior to that date, and those are things we just have to work through. I think what we're saying is continue to bird dog it and just change it as fast as you can. We understand that sometimes that schools don't release people as fast as they can. I know as a coordinator, I was calling other coordinators on this webinar and saying, hey, I just need a kid release. Can you help me with that? Uh, as, as many of you called me to do that. So um, we understand all those issues. I think it's just understanding how all these pieces work together so that there can be a good flow between ECATS and PowerSchool. And one of the big reasons that I think we all wanted kind of Sue Ann to come is really so you could see this graphic sitting in front of you so that you knew where the data flowed from PowerSchool into ECATS. And then also she put up the one about ECATS into PowerSchool so that you know how those pieces of data flowed from ECATS into you because I don't know that as long as I was involved with PowerSchool and the ECATS conversation that I ever saw exactly the data flow like it is in front of us. So my hope is is that you will now have the ability to understand how these two systems work together, albeit not perfect, this is how they work together in, in the meantime. Uh, as we continue to work through issues, I think one thing that I'm hoping we can help mix up here is some of those questions asked. Um, I would like to believe if there's something wrong in ECATS, I don't say, well, that's ECATS fault, or if there's something wrong on the ECATS side, they say, well, that's Power School's fault. I, I think that Sue Ann and I and our team will work to try to work through issues so that they're just fixed. That's uh -huh. correct. Um, I know, you know, like I said, Power School right now is having the trouble with the EC screen, but Lorenzo is working hard to get that fixed. I mean, we talk to him just about every day, every other day. So understand that between the Power School and ECATS, we're going to get it fixed for you. So, um, and I know that that gets awful hard in, in the districts because it wasn't that long ago that I was out there sitting in the EC offices uh, in my district talking to them about this pretty regularly. So I hope that those conversations continue and that we can help get those kids in and out of the proper databases quickly with the right data so that it flows well. Um, Sue Ann, I thank you for coming. Um, I don't think that there are any questions in the chat. If John or Justin or Tessa want to jump in and answer some that maybe we can answer. Um, I don't mind with until we have a chance to thoroughly look at those and make sure we're giving you the proper answers. Yeah, and I'm sure there's some more ECATS questions that came in that, that really need answered um, properly because I know there's a lot of information out there that is not accurate. And and I hope that this was beneficial for you and, and, and came across accordingly. Um, but Sue Ann, we are very thankful again for you being here. Um, I want to thank Justin um, for kind of putting all this together and, and making sure that we had something for you with this. Um, and thank you. You're we... welcome. Yeah, thank you, Sue Ann. John, can you take back over? Uh, yes, Sue Ann will have to pass the, the little presenter ball back to me. Um, I think if you right click me in the participant list, it should give you that option. I gotta or Justin, you. you might be able to too. Got it. Yep. Thank you. Sweet. Okay. While he's putting that up, I know my screen right here. We had a lot of questions on several things, and Rob, I think it'd be best if we break them down into topics. We had a lot of questions on contacts, um, the cats questions. So we'll do our best to split those up and send them out so that they're not hard to search through. And hopefully, we'll have that Friday. Um, 
FERPA, we were getting a lot of questions. There is a due date, I think, of October 1st for that collection, and we've still not sent the form out to you guys yet. Uh, we're having a hard time internally, and Rob, you might can speak more to this, but we've not gotten, even though we have the form, we've not gotten the approval to share it out yet. I, I, and that's where I am right now, That's and I will try to get more clarification by this week. Yeah, and then the contacts, we know there's there's still an issue with the inactive contacts being created for whatever reason. Power School's still looking at that. Um, another biggie, contacts related. We keep getting asked, and we do go back and ask Power School, can we turn off um, the transfer of contacts when a student goes from one LEA to a, another? And I think uh, we're being told it can't be done right now, but I do think that it can be done when we upgrade to 20.4. I think that's actually part of it. So we're working on that. I look up with the cleanup. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Tessa or John, do you see any other questions that we can tackle for sure right now? Um, I do see one about if they need to fill in the contacts page only for EC students. Um, and I think the GPI advice would be to fill that out for everybody. Rob, have we asked PowerSchool about changing the name of schools? Um, we have not, but we can do that today. Okay. Yeah, we can ask, see if we can change the name. Do you know, is there a reason we can't change the name of the CCAS school? Oh, wait a minute. Um, I'm not sure that we'll need to go through um, Ashley and, and the EC division to make sure that there's a okay. reason it can't be changed. I think there may be, but we need to find out for sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll check on that. Yeah, it's a different platform, so it's a little messy the way we're reading questions come in. So we'll take those and we'll break them down into categories and share them out. Um, if you would, I have a feeling we're going to get more feedback this time than ever because there's a CEU attached to it. So if you would, just take a second and fill out the feedback survey. We'll just hang on this screen for a couple of minutes. This will be shared out. Um, I did record most of it. I think I missed about three minutes in the very, very beginning, but this will be posted. I think Yolanda will be able to share it out on Friday. And Justin, I want to let them know too, if they have questions or if they EC people come to them, ask them to just go to the EC site and they can review this webinar also, I mean this PowerPoint also. I'll have it posted for them. Okay, thank you. Oh, good question. Somebody asked if the COVID grading script is still running. Did we turn that off yet, Rob? I believe it has been turned off, but we can verify. Yes, the FERPA form, we're, we're going to push to try to get that out, so we'll get more. Even if we don't have it by Friday, we'll have some kind of update for you. <clears throat> I thought we'd end up going over, but we kept it right in time. Again, I know this format was a little different. We had to rush through the updates, but we've got all the information shared with you, and then we'll think different, I think, is the questions will be answered in a document rather than taking the time to go through all the questions right here. And a lot of times that's best because most of the questions we have to go and talk to other folks and make sure we're telling you the right thing. So everybody that's on this, um, I'll make sure that everybody that signed in and provided the feedback, for sure, there's an email address in there. We'll, we'll send this directly to you, and then Yolanda will also put it in the bulletin. Anything else from anybody at DPI? All right. If not, I really appreciate you guys attending. Emily, thanks for opening up for us. And Sue Ann, definitely thanks for taking the time 
put this together and help share the ECAPS information. Um, be on the lookout for upgrade information, class size documents being released, and everything else that we've covered today. Have a good one, guys. Thank you.